muito bom, muito bom dia a todos. Eu vou introduzir em português e depois em inglês, não é, é difícil de entender. Uh, muito obrigado à Clabin por, por, por me convidarem e pela oportunidade de partilhar a visão e o entusiasmo da BeWorks para inovação. E é muito interessante, é muito interessante estar em um lugar como like a OCA, Niemeyer's OCA, que não tem no walls. E o que isso significa é que as walls que estão deixadas são as walls dentro da nossa mente. E eu vou apontar um, que é a resistência à pensamento científico. So let's start, actually, by having you do some work and an exercise of imagination. So for a couple of moments, imagine a scientist. Close your eyes, leave your eyes open, and imagine what a scientist looks like. So you probably thought, okay, you probably thought of a lab coat, maybe messy hair, big glasses, maybe a white male, maybe someone who looks nerdy, and you maybe even thought about the surroundings, a lab, fancy equipment. Now, the answers are so consistent across people that you can have an inventory of what a scientist looks like. Now, it's time to change this. What few of you thought about is that a scientist looks like you. And why is this important? It's important for two reasons. The first one is that it distances ourselves from the exercise of science, and most importantly, it distances ourselves of the ability to think critically, of the ability to think like a scientist. And few of us are, have had continuous exposure to science. Probably the last time we did something called science was in the biology lab in middle school or in high school. So it's time to rethink that. And so that is the goal of my presentation, is that at the end of the presentation, if someone asks you to think of a scientist, how does a scientist look like? I want to think that you imagine yourselves as a scientist. And if you do that, I consider this talk to be successful. Now, I'm going to talk about three things. First, I'm going to teach you how to think like a scientist. What are the building blocks of thinking critically about real-world problems? The second one is that I'm going to talk about behavioral economics. And why behavioral economics? Because it's a branch of thinking how people behave that is grounded on experimentation and critical thinking. And finally, based on BU works, I'm going to give you concrete steps to transform your organization. So let's start uh, um, by thinking how we discover the scientific thinker within us. We don't need to go to a lab. We don't need fancy equipment to act like a scientist. Everyday life already gives us, and in your work, already gives us enough problems that are complex enough to think critically about the problem. So let's give a scenario that you are familiar with, which is the grocery store. So let's imagine that you are in a grocery store and you observe that your lane is taking longer than usual. So you start with a question and you start gathering observations. Well, maybe it's because there are too much produce in the carts and produce takes a long time to scan. So you gather observations and you go around, test your hypothesis and look for evidence that the carts have too much produce. And after that the case, then you would switch lanes. But let's say that, no, it's not because of produce. Maybe it's because there are not enough lanes. So you look around, you see if there are other lanes that are available. And let's say that there are not, that there are enough lanes. Then you look at the cashier. And you say, is the cashier scanning the items efficiently or not? Are the other cashiers being as efficient as my cashier? So in this simple example, what your mind did was three building blocks of scientific thinking. You had a question. You gathered observations to answer your question. You started formulating theories about what actually is going on in the real world. And then you jump to solutions. Oh, maybe I should switch lanes. Or if I were the director of this company, maybe we should train the cashier. And so this is important because as leaders, as strategists, as advocates for our clients, we need to have the richest knowledge and the strongest tools to guide our thinking. And it just so happens that scientific thinking is an excellent toolkit for 
innovation. Now there's a catch. There's a, a second piece to scientific thinking. Is that scientists approach their observations by first trying to prove themselves wrong. So if they observe and they think, okay, maybe it's because there's too much produce in the carts, the first thing scientists do is to observe and see maybe there's not enough produce, let them measure the amount of produce. Maybe the cashier is inefficient. Well, rather than confirming that, let's observe the, the, how efficient the cashier is, and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm right. So another piece is that scientists sometimes trust their intuition by generating hypotheses, and other times put their intuition to the side and gather more observations or look at prior research. This is what is called standing on the shoulders of giants. So it was Newton who coined this famous sentence when they asked him, how did you predict the trajectory of the Halley Comet? And he said, well, I just stood on the shoulders of giants. I just went to see what other scientists before me said. And that's why I have these two pictures here of Da Vinci and Hume, because both said the importance of gathering observations, the importance of putting intuition aside and gathering more and more observations. So how does this connect back to the science of lines? Well, it turns out that alongside the root causes that we hypothesize, the protos, the full cart, there's a whole psychology of waiting in line. And so, and interestingly, all of, this, all of these articles are in the public domain, again emphasizing that there is no barrier between accessing these articles other than our own internal barriers. And what these articles say is that the perception of how long a line is, is a crucial factor. So if you ask people, how long do you think you have been in line? And people will say, oh, well over 10 minutes. It turns out if you go with a stopwatch and actually measure it, it's around six minutes. So there's a significant margin of error between what people think and what's actually happening. So how does this connect to innovation? Is that behavioral research suggests that strategies that address the perception of wait times can be as effective as operational solutions. In fact, more effective if we take into account the cost of simply putting a sign please let us know if the line is more than 10 minutes. What this gives is this reduces the anxiety that people have by giving them control and thinking, okay, now I know I have an action. If the line is more than 10 minutes, I should call the assistant. And so, other than gathering root observations and root causes, the other piece is to have humility about our own intuition. So that is the second piece of thinking like a scientist, is having the humility that our intuition might not be right and looking for prior research. And then something that will be the focus of the rest of my talk, testing hypothesis and not being afraid to test. Testing is like a small case that you can test whatever you want. And as you'll see, I'll present a couple of examples where the hypothesis that it was the most strange, the strangest one, was the one that worked. And other times when the hypothesis that was the most conservative actually worked. And that speaks to the importance of testing. So we go on, we have a question, we observe, we hypothesize what's going on, and we have the humility to stand back and ask whether our observations are correct. So what are we trying to apply scientific thinking to? I'm going to argue that we're all in the business of behavioral change. We're all trying to change someone else's behavior. It might be that we're trying to change the behavior of people who hire employees, or we're trying to change the customer's choices by buying more or buying less of something, of recycling more, changing our own behavior of saving more, eating differently, or exercising more. So the common thread is that we're all trying to change behavior. And this is where behavioral economics is. Behavioral economics is an intersection of behavioral change and scientific thinking. And so the traditional view of why people act the way they do is because they don't have enough information or they don't care enough or they care too much about that particular behavior. Now, behavioral economics has a different view. It says it's not that people 
have preferences for a certain behavior, which they do, is that on top of that, people are not supercomputers. Our decisions are constrained by time, mental energy, and limited willpower. Even in the presence of all the information in the world, we'll still make decisions that appear to be irrational. And why is that? Because we use mental shortcuts that were honed through the process of evolution. And these mental shortcuts are called heuristics. Now, most of the time, these mental shortcuts work, and some other times they don't, and they lead to what, what is called biases, which are systematic deviations from what a traditional economic model would say. So here's a little quick history of behavioral economics. It's a buzzword. The Nobel Prize last year was awarded to a prominent behavioral economist, Richard Taylor. So it went all the way to the 1750s when people talked about, Adam Smith talked about the importance of incorporating all these factors in choice that have nothing to do um, with a simple mathematical model incorporating things like emotions, morals. What does the other person think of my actions? And then it disappeared in the 20th century in favor of a more elegant mathematical model. And back in the 50s, there's a discussion and more evidence that people are not supercomputers. We cannot think exhaustively about every single choice we do. And so for that reason, we satisfy. That means that we reason to a certain extent and that we pause and we decide. Then Kahneman and Tversky did a crucial experiment showing that people value losses more than gains of the same magnitude, and that probabilities are not weighted linearly. Richard Thaler, an economist, he accumulated all the anomalies in behavior that differ from, um, from the standard economic model. And then Dan Ariely, one of the co-founders of BE Works, brought all these anomalies tested in the lab to everyday choices. How do people save? How do people eat? And so forth. And there are many patterns of irrationality that influence judgment and decision making. These are what are called the heuristics and biases. And it's one of the pillars of behavioral economics. There are over 300 documented biases. And I'm going to give you an example of what is one of the most important, the status quo bias. Is that all else being equal, we prefer things to be the same as they are. We prefer to go with the default option. And to see that this is truly the case, I'm going to give you two classic examples. They're kind of shocking and amazing that they work. The first one is organ donations. Now take a look at this graph. On the x-axis, you have a series of countries. And on the y-axis, you have the donation, uh, the donation rate. And there's a stark contrast, because the countries in orange have donation rates above 80%, and the countries in blue have donation rates of, or donation rates of organs below 20%. Now, what's going on? There's only one human species. So how do we explain this? It turns out we can explain this by the way the enrollment in organ donation happens. The countries with a very low donation rate are opt-in. People have to go to a website, or people have to go to a department. People have to fill out the form to donate organs. Whereas in the countries in, Oregon, in orange, donations are automatic. Instead, people have to fill out a form to opt out of the organ donation. So this is evidence for the status quo bias, is that all else being equal, you prefer things to be the same. You prefer not to make a decision, particularly if that decision is complicated like donating an organ. How can I compute the value of donating an organ? It's so abstract and so far in the future and uncertain. So the power of behavioral economics is to leverage the biases to help people make better decisions. You take something like status quo bias and say, OK, if making a decision is hard, let's remove the decision and provide people with the option they want. Now, the defaults are probably the classic and most powerful cases. There are a series of other what are called nudges. Another example, you might think that this is specific to organ donation. It's not. Another example is savings. Now, what we're looking here in this graph is the savings profiles in a large US company. And in blue over here, so this is in X, in the X axis is years in the company. And in blue over here is the, en the enrollment rate and the savings plan that the company offered over time. So as you see, as people are in the company longer and longer, they save more. They enroll more often in the program. It might be because of information. It might be because they start thinking about saving. 
In 1998, the company changed their policies. They, the savings program is economically equivalent, the same caps, the same contribution. But participants were enrolled automatically in the plan. And you see this hike over here, is that enrollment increased around 80%. Now you think, if this is a true preference, then you should see people opting out back to this level. And you didn't see that. People did not opt out of this program. So this is another example. Savings and organ donation are two classic examples of defaults. Now, a note of caution. It's just because we can impact people's choices does not mean we should. And there are two crucial pieces in the ethics of behavioral economics or the ethics of behavioral change. The first one is consent. So if you ask people, do you want to save more money? Yes, I do. And the second one is transparency. People knew they were being automatically enrolled. So these are two crucial pieces for making any behavioral change ethical, consent and transparency. So how popular is this approach? In the public sector, quite popular. This is a snapshot of two behavioral units in public sector that used behavioral economics to things like taxes, organ donation, renewal of license plates, and things exploded. This is a sample in 2017, last year, of the public units that used behavioral economics. Now, why am I talking about the public sector? to talk, to highlight that the private sector has been slow in catching up with the importance of using behavioral economics in conducting, uh, in changing whatever policy is needed. So behavioral economics is this three-legged stool, and now we're going to connect to the scientific thinking. The first part is a, an understanding an understanding of behavior that is based on heuristics and biases. People are not supercomputers. The second one is that can we turn those biases into what are called nudges? Just change the environment slightly. Put healthier food at high level, for instance, an example of a nudge, and make people more likely to choose and easy to avoid the, their choices if they don't want to. The third part that connects to the beginning of the talk is experimentation. The only way behavioral economics found out that all these things were true, that people were not deciding as rational models would say, is because of experimentation. It's because they went and asked, is the standard economic model true or not? Sometimes yes, other times not. So this brings to the third part of the stool of behavioral economics. So I'm going to give you now an example of experimentation in behavioral economics and see how a couple of conditions were set up. So how do we encourage people to save? This was an experiment that Dan Ariely, one of the co-founders, did in Kenya. So governments in Africa are interested that people save, that people are more prepared and more resilient for what's to come. In Kenya, the challenge was that one fewer than one in five people had a bank account. Instead, there was a mobile phone uh, uh, system that exchanged airtime for money. But still, even when the system that was very accessible, called Safaricom, even when the system that made savings very accessible at the tip of their fingers, only one in three people had an active account in the last three months. So this was clearly a behavioral problem. So what did they th thought? Well, people have their cell phones. How about we give them reminders? Reminders are simple, they're effective, they work in things like medication adherence. If you want people to take medication for diseases that have no symptoms, reminders are a great way to start. So just send reminders every week about the importance of saving. So here's an example. People would get weekly text message reminders with an account balance things like, please don't forget to save for your future this week. And this runs counter what is called the present biases, is that people prefer the discount future outcomes in favor of present outcomes. So this should help. The other one was to make the reminder even more tangible, make the future of your savings very, very tangible, and put the image, not the image, but remind them of the importance of saving for a child's future. This is something that worked, for instance, in charities, where putting the image of an identifiable victim increases the likelihood that people donate. 
it turns out it does not increase donation amount, but it at least makes people more likely to donate. So participants in the study would get a message like this. Hi, Daddy and Mommy. Please deposit as much as you can this weekend to the account for our future. Thank you for saving and then the name of the child. Now, another condition that we tested, and this was born out of standard economics, well, what if we match their savings? Let's just give them a financial incentive to save, and that will increase the likelihood that they will save. And this is something that, again, has been seen, for instance, in medication adherence, just by giving a lottery or a financial incentive, people are more likely to take their medication. So in this case, they tried two conditions, a financial match of 10% of their contribution and a financial match of 20%. You might say, a financial match of 20%, that's crazy. That's not sustainable, that's not scalable. Now that is some of the beauty of experimenting, is that with a smaller sample, you can just try and see the parameters of what you're trying to understand. So we might not even test or imp launch a 20% match, but at least we know how it responds to a marginal increase of an additional 10%. And the financial incentive was framed in two ways. Again, because framing is something shown to be important. One was framed as a gain. So this is at the beginning of the week, they were told, hey, you'll get 10 or 20% if you say this week. So this is pre-match. And then another one, it was almost missing out. Hey, you will lose the 10% if you did not save. And this is to capitalize on the fact that given a loss of the same similar magnitude, people are more responsive to losses than to gains. So if someone tells you, if I toss a coin and say, here's a fair coin. If I toss this coin and you get heads, you get $100. If I toss this coin and, and you get tails, you, get, you lose $50. And so it turns out that you need a gain that is twice the amount of the losses for people to decide to play this game. And loss aversion, as you'll see, is an important part in preventing innovation. Oh, and there was another condition, kind of a crazy condition. People were giving a plastic coin, with kind of a heavy plastic coin with the weight of a gold coin. And on the coin, there were tangible images of savings. And each of these numbers is one of the weeks in the study. The study ran for about six months, so there were 24 weeks. And so the people could scratch the week that they saved. They got a text reminder, which didn't tell them to save. It just told them, hey, if you saved, remember to scratch the coin. And they were told to put the coin in a visible place in their households. It's kind of a wacky idea. This would never make it in the boardroom. So let's vote and think which condition do you think led to the most savings? So imagine you're in a boardroom and you're trying to prioritize and you're trying to say, which of the conditions do I have a hunch that should work? So raise your hands if you think the weekly test reminder, simple, effective, should work. Okay. What about the weekly text reminder from children? Any candidates? Great. What about the financial match of 10%? Who, who thinks the financial match of 10% would be appealing to lead people to save? Great. What about the match of 20%? Okay, you're rational. We saw twice the number of people. What about the loss saying, okay, you're going to lose? Okay, great. We have people who know about loss aversion. What about a loss of 20%? What about the gold coin? So let's look at the results. Let's see where the jury is. The surprising thing, I'll go to the punchline. The gold coin won the savings. It's completely out of, out of, out of our minds. How does such a simple intervention work? Now, of course, we have always to compare to control and compare to things we already knew. So over here, over here is no intervention. So these were people outside of the 2400 that did not participate in this six-month promotional period. Next, you have the reminder control. And it's interesting that it aligned with your intuition because no one voted for the simple reminder. Then we have, these ones are kind of puzzling. These two, these run counter to the standard economic model. 
you would say that a financial match of 20% should be the one that had the highest participation rate, and yet it was not significantly different from the reminder. The kids had a little more, but still nothing as powerful as the coin. So why do we think the coin worked in this particular case? It's because it gave a tangible reminder, a t very tangible reminder of something that is quite abstract, which is the importance of saving. So why I'm putting this case, how does this, why does this relate to innovation? It's because if we were in a boardroom, you probably never test the gold coin condition. And that is the importance of thinking like a scientist and thinking of experimenting is that it gives a safe space for failure. It's say, okay, let's just put these conditions out to the test. It doesn't mean we're going to scale it to the entire organization. Just put it to the test and see if it works. And so it's not the person with the loudest voice in the room that gets to dictate what goes. It's just let's all conditions are equal. What matters is the method of testing, not the question itself, though the question is important. And so scientific thinking can empower us to thinking that we actually can innovate. So when asked in a survey of senior executives, only 35% of them reported that they had confidence in their firm's ability to innovate. But there are barriers to innovation, thinking of this in terms of a behavioral economics perspective. And the barriers are two that we can think of. The first one, is that innovation is quite an abstract. It's kind of like savings. You need to innovate. Instead, we have to make it operational and make it very concrete. We can define innovation as change, or we can even define it as positive change. But that doesn't leave room for failure, which is an essential part of scientific thinking. And that is a safeguard of the experimental method. The second one is loss aversion, is that losses loom larger than gains particularly for an intervention that is new. People have a paradoxical accountability. And so by removing these two barriers, by giving a safe space to experiment, that's B-Works vision, is that experimentation can overcome these barriers. And listen, we're not going to scale to the organization, we're just going to test in a smaller sample. The other thing that is interesting, and this doesn't come from scientific uh, uh, study is that innovation is treated in an outcome in companies who are perceived to be most innovative. And that is an example of Clabini who has their center for innovation. It's not an abstract thing. It's something that has to be invested to be a process in itself where you have to devote efforts to innovate. Our argument is that anyone can innovate as long as they think of their day-to-day -day as an experiment. Now we talked about two types of innovation, one radical, another iterative. And usually when we think about innovation, we think of the former, the radical, kind of the gold coin. Let's try out something that has never been tried before. But iterative innovation is also important. You kind of build on the shoulders of giant and you accumulate knowledge. So I'm going to give you now two examples from BeWorks, two case studies from BeWorks, where we did that sort of iterative innovation. And the first one, it's interesting because we tested something that didn't exist. So we tested a product that didn't exist yet. Sometimes you can even test things, and this is to call the attention, that you can test things that don't exist yet. Now, I don't want to get philosophical here. I'll explain what I mean. So a global beverage company was interested in changing the way people consume beer. Rather than people consuming a single can or a couple of cans, which is a pain to distribute it, and it's a problem to recycle. It's a huge environmental waste. What if people would buy a keg and a draft tower, and the keg would maintain beer fresh for one month? Now, this is a significant behavioral shift from how people consume beer. There's no longer the pop and the fizz for opening a can of beer. The problem is that the client was not interested in launching a new product and then putting it in the market and seeing it fail as it often happens. So how can we test a product that didn't exist? We didn't want to ask in a survey because surveys have what is called the intention action gap. There is a gap between what people intend to do and a gap between what people do. Not out of maliciousness, but because people's actions are bounded 
by limited time, limited willpower, and limited energy. So what we did is that we tested the box. So the box was designed, and we filled the box with sand so that the box had the same weight as the actual draft tower. And then we sold the box, the draft tower, and the keg next to the beer cans. And we saw how many people approached the, the box, put it in their cart, and took them to the, the cashier. And then what we would do is that we would take the person and explain, we would take them to a separate room and explain that this was actually a study, we would give them a survey and a gift certificate of $20. So this way we can get a correlate, a measure of actual real world purchase. So here's what happens, and it was quite surprising. So we tested a couple of conditions. Some conditions, the draft tower was sold separately. Other conditions, the draft tower was sold as a bundle. And in other conditions, the draft tower was sold at the discount. And so across the different conditions, there's a huge variability. You see, this one is more than five times different the, the, the purchase or the intention to purchase in the cart than the worst performer. And again, this speaks to the importance of testing. Now I'm going to talk about a different challenge, again, iterative innovation. And this is something that hadn't been tried before in a classroom context. How do we increase classroom attendance rates amongst adult learners? So this was largest, the, the largest vocational training college in Canada, a for-profit college, who was interested in increasing attendance rates in adult learners in their college. And attendance rates are a very important problem. They're facing dropout rates on the order of 90%. So only 10% of the people at the end of the course actually had a diploma. Why does this matter? This matters at an individual level that people don't get to pursue what they wanted. It also matters at a financial level because the college would not be able to report uh, levels of enrollment to the financial board. So here's how we diagnosed why are people dropping out. Not because they don't want to attend, rather there are behavioral barriers. There's lack of su social support networks. Many of these people were first time uh, university attendees and there was no social support that uh, underscored the importance of uh, enrolling in university. There was poor history of poor performance during compulsory education, leading to a fragile confidence. There was lack of positive feedback and encouragement, and these two are related. There was also high opportunity costs. Many of these adult learners faced competing demands. They had to take care of their family, they had work to do, and many other uh, demands. And then there's planning problems. It's a difficult landscape to navigate, kind of like the savings problem. Which savings plan do I want to do? What do I need to do in my course to finish my degree? The number one that arose out of stakeholder interviews and prior research and community college attendance was the lack of social support networks. So rather than assign people to a buddy, how can we increase in a simple and effective way the amount of social support that people get? So again, we tried with text messages. So people would get a text message, hey, and then their first name, you've got this and we've got you see you on campus. So this is emphasizing that there is a community of people interested and invested in their progress. And the nudge here is providing encouragement and positive reinforcement to counter the lack of social support. And then we have planning problems and procrastination. We wanted to make their success and their progress very tangible. And so people will get a text match. Hey, Jose, how many days will you commit to coming to campus this week? so that their actions were very tangible, rather than an abstract action like, you have to innovate. Text us our goal. And here the nudge is something called implementation intention, is that when people specify the time and the place and the actual action they're going to do, they're more likely to follow through with their intention than if they just say, I want to attend classes. So over about 700 adult learners, we distributed them across uh, we experimented and we distributed it across three groups. One was the control group, so there's no, no incentive, no text reminder. The other one was a text reminder, and the other one was an email group. And the text group and the email group both received one message each for 11 weeks. And the messages varied from 
positive reinforcement to implementation intention to social norm, saying that other colleagues are also interested in pursuing uh, uh, your education from making their progress and the consequences of their progress very tangible, kind of like the plight of the child. So here's what we saw. So on the, on the X axis, you have uh, attendance rates over the course of the degree, and here you have the attendance rates. And as you can see, is that people in the control group, in both all groups, perform attendance rate decreased. But the interesting thing is that there was a difference between the control group and the reminder group of 4.5 to 7 percent. And no intervention that the community college had tried before had this sort of impact. And such a simple thing, such as sending an email and a text reminder. Now, I'm not here to tell you that in order to innovate, you need to send text reminders. Rather, I'm highlighting and underscoring the importance of testing. And in testing, is a plain level field. You can include crazy, include crazy conditions like the gold coin to simple things like a text reminder. And in the end of my talk, I'm going to talk about how we approach a variety of problems. So these are three specific case studies that I gave. If we had any case study, this is how we would approach it at BU Works. And we approach it by a five steps, and I encourage you to take these five steps and start thinking about your problems in this way. So the first step is discovery. The second is behavioral diagnostics. What are the behavioral barriers to the behavior we want to change? Next, there's ideation, and these two are sort of partners because the behavioral diagnosis is highlighting the barriers, the ideation is designing the nudges. Next comes the crucial part, prototype and experiment. This is where we actually design an experiment and put out uh, the truth. Let's see what actually works. Now, something that I was surprised when I learned is the origin of the word data. The origin of the word data comes from Latin, and that mean, and it means that which is observed. It comes from the idea in Roman times that you launch your dice and then you observe the outcome, and that's data. So data is simply what you observe from a rollout, from chance, from your experiment. And then finally, you do what it's called a choice architecture. We recommend a particular environment where the people are making the choice. So in discovery, what comes into discovery? It comes the beginning of what we're talking about in the shopping cart. First, be curious. Ask questions. Why is my lane taking longer? Second, gather observations. You can gather observations in an overall perspective. You can also gather observations specific to your hypothesis. Is, are, is there a lot of produce in the carts? Are the carts full? Is the cashier inefficient? The other important part, and this is particularly important as we're talking about innovation, is that innovation is kind of a fluffy word. It's very abstract. Instead, we have to make it concrete. We have to make the target measurable and observable. So an example, a bank approached us and was very interested in measuring brand loyalty. And we said, we have to pin that down. We have to make brand loyalty very concise. And so we made it as probability of repurchase probability of revisiting one of their uh, agencies. And this is a couple of examples. So always make the target behavior measurable and observable. There's no point in coming up with root causes that you can't observe. So if you think that, oh, people might be, uh, uh, people might be thinking about something else as they are in the cart, it might be hard to observe. You can observe the eye gaze, for instance. The second part, once you have your problem defined, once you have the behavior you want to define, and innovation can be one, you determine the decision points in that journey, and you identify the biases in prior scientific research. Now, to think about biases, if you haven't read, I recommend Predictably Irrational by Daniel Rielli, or Thinking Fast or Slow by Daniel Kahneman. So they describe in a series of experiments the way in which people think and the way in which the the way we think is different from a standard economic model. And we also explore prior scientific research. We go back and we build on the shoulders of giants and we ask what has been done, what has been tried, what has been shown to work in the field and in the lab, and both are equal and both have their advantages. 
So we build a customer journey or a client journey or an employee journey of the behavioral barriers. And it can be things like status quo bias. To start with, people don't want to make a decision or the decision is too hard to make. The next one is use the biases to nudge behavior. So if people don't want to make a decision, let's remove the decision from the picture. Or for instance, if people are concerned about making a positive impression on others, so let's use social norms to make them more likely to choose the actions they really want to choose. And we need to think of going beyond traditional approaches that rely on information and incentives. There's tons of studies showing that information backfires, that providing more information makes people less likely to choose or more likely to choose in a way that's run counter. For instance, the example is in privacy studies, one of the classical examples, is that by providing footnotes with information, much people trust less the entity that is providing the footnote, as if makes people think, why am I being given this additional information? Not only that, beyond trust, it's more complicated. People don't have the time and energy to read all the information. The other one is incentives. Incentives backfire. One of the classical examples was that in, in a study where parents had to pick up their kids on time from a childcare, and the childcare was facing the problem that parents were leaving their kids later than usual. So they thought, how about we introduce a penalty for parents who leave their kids in the childcare? Here's what happened. The rate at which people left their kids in the childcare increased. Why? Because the penalty gave some sort of moral license to leave the kids in the daycare. It almost gave a price. It's almost like, as long as I paid a price, which is fine, then I can leave the kids in the childcare. So this is, again, penalties and incentives work in very strange ways. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't. If we increase the price of a good, less people are likely to buy it. But then there are luxury effects. And so uh, the example of the gold coin shows that, is that the incentives were no different than the reminder. So in thinking about how can we ideate, I encourage you to go beyond traditional approaches on information and incentives. And the classic reference here is Nudge by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein, which was published about 10 years ago. How can we encourage people's behavior without enforcement, without adding more information, or without financial incentives? It's an interesting challenge. The next one, and this is crucial, we could stop here, give the audit to our client and say, these are the ideas we recommend. No, we have to get uncomfortable. And we have to put everything, as much as we can, as long as there is enough sample to test it, we have to put everything. All conditions are equal. And so we build prototypes robust enough to test the hypothesis. We make a prediction. Predictions are important so that we are not left out in the blue. But we are open to be surprised. I have to say, after 15 years of running experiments, only one of my experiments worked exactly the way I thought. Not that I didn't have an interpretation of why they didn't work, but there's always more. And the other thing, as much as possible, launch randomized control trials. What this means is that you add a control condition, which can be things as they are, what is happening in the organization right now, and then at the same time, if possible, you have the interventions, and you randomize. You cannot pick who goes in the control condition and who goes and has the experiment. You have to be blind to that. And finally comes the fun part, which is that you analyze the evidence. You observe, going back to the origin of the word data, you observe the outcome. And you document, and then you prepare to iterate. You iterate. There's always a continuous improvement. I cannot tell you how many times I've had to reiterate my experiments. And it's interesting and fun to learn. So what are the benefits of this platform that I talked about? The benefits of thinking like a scientist and incorporating the ways that humans actually decide. One is that democratizes ideas. Ideas are not implemented based on the person who has the loudest voice. They are implemented based on statistical ability to detect an effect. So you put things like the gold coin side by side with a picture of a child. The other one is that experiments create a safe space for failure. It's saying, OK, I understand that it's very costly for you to run a particular intervention in the entire department. How about we run it with a smaller sample? And it's not personal. Nobody is going to point you. I did not judge any of you who did not think the gold coin did not or did work. 
The next one is that this behavioral science and scientific thinking leverages insights we already know, and this is important. So I showed that all the, the papers that I mentioned are all in the public domain. You can access them at the tip of your fingers. Yet there is a barrier because we have a stereotype of what a scientist looks like, of what a person that can read those papers looks like, that prevents us from accessing them. And that's not true. Everyone can conduct experiments, and everyone can think critically. In fact, we already do. We already conduct experiments in our everyday lives. We already think about the root causes. And we already doubt our intuitions. It fosters curiosity. So rather than thinking about what should work, we start thinking about why is this? And that's the first step to start launching the entire process, is start thinking, why is it happening? why I'm not seeing that this line moves faster. And then the final one is asking and answering. And this process is almost like Socrates, just by the process of having another person, and that person can be yourself, that you ask, why is this happening? And you try to come up with an answer. So this is, if you take these ideas and the importance of scientific thinking. If you take anything from this talk, it would be the importance of thinking like a scientist. And the next time that someone asks you, can you imagine what a scientist looks like? Don't think of Einstein. Think of yourselves. Think of someone who thinks about how things work and how can I test them. So in conclusion, the power to transform society and the economy through scientific thinking is within you, is not in the R&D department, is not in the people with the lab coats, is in our own individual ability to think critically and to, be, to leave space to experiment and test. Thank you very much.